Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of SWARP webinar. Today we'll be talking about field trauma triage and air ambulance utilization standards. If you are new to the webinar world, um, what you're going to do is you're going to see a PowerPoint presentation and you're going to hear two presenters with their voice over. If you have any questions or any comments throughout the presentation, you're more than welcome to send those in. Uh, throughout the presentation, if you could send your questions in through the chat box or through the question box that you'll see at the very bottom of your control panel, just type those in and I can see those in the background and I can either answer those directly for you or I can take those questions and bring them to the presenters and they will answer those questions live. Uh, if you'd like to actually speak live during the webinar, then you're more than welcome to do so. There's a, a hand icon that you'll also see on the control panel. And if you push, the, if you click on that hand icon, I can see that you've raised your hands and I can unmute you. Uh, and then you'd be able to speak live. So if we can maybe save those for the end of the presentation, that would be much appreciated. And so again, throughout the presentation, type your questions in through the question box. Uh, and then at the end of the presentation, you'll have the opportunity to click on the hand icon, raise your hand, and then I can unmute you and we can, uh, we can hear you live. Uh, but you'll, you'll need a microphone to do that. Uh, and so I'm going to hand the presentation over to our two presenters, uh, Dr. Mike Lewell and Dr. Mike Pennell. Thanks very much, Stephanie. And uh, hello to everyone that's listening online. And this uh, program will also be recorded. So therefore, it'll be available later on uh, in an offline format that we can also distribute to other services that are interested. As you know, this is a, uh, what we're talking about today is a basic life support patient care standard. And it's a very important one. Um, and that's why it's been released ahead of the new basic life support patient care standards full document. It's been released as what's called a rolling change, meaning that we wanted to get it out as soon as possible. Um, in that regard, we all know that the basic life support patient care standards, the responsibility and the ownership, um, for lack of a better term, falls to the Ontario Association of Paramedic Chiefs as well as the Ministry of Health. So I want you to view this educational thing we're having today as supplemental to ensure the excellent training programs that will be coming forth from the services as well as the Ministry in addition to the training bulletin you have in front of you today. So that being said, we've had lots of questions raised to us by paramedics that we serve. Um, we wanted to have this supplemental educational program available um, to answer some of those questions um, and also to give an overall um, overarching idea as to how we got here today with the release of this new BLS patient care standard. So with me today in the office is uh, Dr. Michael Peddle, who's one of our base hospital physicians and also one of the orange um, uh, patch physicians. Um, and uh, without further ado, why don't we get started? Let's get started. Sounds great. So Mike, how do we get here? Well, this has been a long journey. And so these, uh, I remember actually when they, when they were first released, um, what's called the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Review, which is a document that's actually cr created by the CDC uh, that was released, I think it was in 2009 uh, when it first came out. Correct. Um, and ever since then, what's happened is we've been trying to um, keep up pace with the uh, with the changes to it, as well as to incorporate um, some of the new revisions which came out in 2011, um, and also make a more Canadian version of the American document. So they were originally released in 2009, uh, revisions were made, and finally now we see them released to the Ontario system uh, with a Canadian version. And it's been a lot of different stakeholders, like we'll talk about, um, that have been involved in the creation of this document. Absolutely. I mean, we've had a lot of people involved, and it's been a long road for for yourself and others trying to get this uh, from 2009 to today. Great, and um, one of the feedback pieces we had was the previous document had the field trauma triage standard or the, or the field trauma triage guidelines embedded within the air ambient utilization standard. So one of the fundamental changes you'll see is that there are now two standalone standards. We now have the air ambient utilization standard and the field trauma triage guideline standard or the field trauma triage standard. Standard. You got it. Um, and <clears throat> obviously, these will both be incorporated into the new version of the basic life support patient care standards, which should be released uh, in the coming uh, months to uh, potentially the year. But now that this is out, let's make sure that we're up to speed with what this one currently shows. So what's the whole balance? Really, like, What's the idea behind having a field trauma triage standard, and, and what are we trying to accomplish? So, I mean, essentially what we're trying to do is getting the right patient to the right level of care and doing that based on some clinical indications that you can assess quickly in the field, essentially. Um, and it's really important when you're developing these standards to try and come up with something that doesn't under triage, meaning, you know, not send the patients when they should go, but also doesn't over triage because if you over triage, you're going to overwhelm that resource. It's just not going to be able to keep up with the number of patients you're sending it. And 
there are some numbers. Uh, if you look at the um, surgeons have set up this sort of standard of you want to avoid uh, triage, under triage of about 5%. You want to make sure that you're not missing those patients that really need to get to the trauma center um, because there's a mortality associated with an odds ratio of 7.1 uh, if you need to go and are under triaged away from that level 1 trauma center. And then limiting that over triage to somewhere between the 10 to 50% range. Um, and those ones are, are very hard. And you'll see as we talk about some of these, uh, these guidelines or the, the sort of the, the points in all of the different steps, some of them are more sensitive and specific than others. To me, what this, the essence of what these documents actually show is, is trying to define that trauma population. Many of us, we look at a trauma, we go, well, that guy's a trauma. And you look at other patients that have been involved in collisions and go, well, that person is a trauma. But who are the trauma people, the trauma patients that actually require a lead trauma hospital and attempts to define that population more succinctly? Exactly. Because many people, when you walk up to a, a, a car crash or a fall, you look at them and go, yeah, you've been a victim of a trauma, but who are the ones buried amongst that pool of patients that actually are the most injured that require a lead trauma hospital and then will benefit from that mortality save you're discussing. Exactly. And so this attempts to define who those actual patients are. And so with a lens like that, let's take a look at what we're talking about. So you have the documents uh, released to you. So therefore, I don't want to spend the we don't want to spend the majority of today talking about what they actually show. We want to sort of break them down and look at them piece by piece. So step one is the physiological parameters. Um, and, and the key here, Mike, is, is we look first at what are their actual unstable vital signs. Like are they vital signs such that they should actually come to the lead trauma hospital? And if you break down um, how do we arrive at those numbers, this is sort of how we arrive at those specific numbers. And Mike, can you take us some time and walk through what we're talking about here in terms of the actual um, statistics you're looking at? Because you're younger than I am. <laughs> I don't know about that, not by much. So yeah, absolutely. And the key to remember with this, Mike, is these aren't just sort of random numbers that were picked out of the air. Mm. You know, the CDC uh, sat down and, and looked at all the literature that is out there, and there's a fair bit of literature looking at uh, trauma patients, as we'll talk about a little bit later. But it looked at that and sort of said, which of these vital signs really do um, show mortality or the risk of mortality. Um, and so one of the sort of the variables that they use is ISS, which is the injury severity score. And I think, uh, you know, maybe why don't you give the sure. audience a briefing on that injury, injury severity score to start. I'm glad we're talking about this because for me, like when you look at these, these numbers, how we arrive at these numbers, there's not just random. We said, yeah, an unstable patient should be less than 90 or an unstable patient should be a GCS less than 13 uh, or less than 14 like it's written in the actual document. Um, it's it's how we got there and what these actually exactly. reflect and what the likelihood of this person going to be severely injured. Well, when we look at trauma systems, we actually look at a, a retrospectively calculating a, a number called an injury severity score, ISS. And what this does, it, it looks at organ systems, six different organ systems, and it grades the injury you could have to those organ systems from one through five. This is done retrospectively by our statisticians and our trauma programs. So if a life-threatening, unsurvivable injury is a five, for instance, um, of that organ system scale of one through five, then what that number does is it takes the sum of the squares, the top three most injured organ systems. Therefore, the maximum you would get would be five in three different organ systems. Summing the squares of that would be 25 times three, which gives you 75. So a person that's got the maximum ISS score would be 75. Well, we know retrospectively that as soon as you start getting an ISS greater than 15, this is where the real benefit comes from trauma systems. And so what we've tried to design is a system that captures what the likelihood we're going to capture the ISS greater than 15 patients and bring them to a trauma hospital. And that's what I was trying to allude to earlier about this essentially defines that trauma population. Finding the severely injured buried amongst all the car crashes and all the falls and all the other injuries that get out there uh, and identify who are the most severely injured. Exactly, and it's a great, great uh, summary of that complicated math for me. I, know, I didn't know they'd be math over the end of the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I know, exactly. So uh, when you look at that, we, they use ISS uh, 15 as that sort of cutoff. You look at GCS. So GCS 13 or less, there are some other studies that look at more of the 14, which matches where we are here. But an ISS greater than 15, the, if you have a GCS less than 15, the odds less ratio, than so GCS sorry, less than 13, I apologize, yes, the odds ratio that you're going to have an ISS greater than 15 or have that severe injury is 33. 
And uh, for those who, you know, odds ratios are, are one of these things that it's basically a way of describing the strength of an association between two independent, or two variables that may or may not be independent. So essentially, you're, if your GCS is less than 13, mm -hmm. you're 33 more times likely to have an ISS greater than 15 because of that. Okay. Whether it's directly related to your GCS or something else that's causing your GCS to be less than 13, mm. it, we don't know. But ultimately, if it's less than 13, there's a good chance your ISS is going to be greater than 15 when we retrospectively calculate it. Got it. So we know these are severely injured patients by that demographic, much more so than, for instance, someone who's just got a slightly impaired level of conscience. And that, that, that the relationship decreases as a GCS increases. So exactly. if your GCS 14 or GCS 15, this is where we get into too much over triage potentially if we bring... Exactly. And the same thing with systolic blood pressure. Mike. Yeah, so if you look at systolic blood pressure, you know, the odds ratio uh, for an ISS greater than 15 is 46, so very, uh, you know, it's a good solid number there. Mm. And even if you just look at, not even just the ISS, but major surgery, so we're going to require a major surgery or have a death associated with it, you know, an odds ratio of 14 in multivariate analysis. So that's mm -hmm. that's a pretty significant number. You're 14 more times likely to require a major surgery, so requiring a, probably a trauma center with with good resource for from a surgical perspective, or die from this trauma. Mm -hmm. So you know, they're not soft numbers. They're not numbers that are just brought up off the top of our heads. These are numbers that come from solid literature. So in step two, that, that same association sort of increase, uh, it continues in that we know that in step two that um, if you use the um, anatomical um, factors you noticed in, in step two, that actually um, identify an additional 20 to 30 percent of patients not just picked up by, by step one. Exactly. And I think the strongest thing is even, I'm not, it's not the strongest because admission rates aren't the strongest indicator, but 86% of these patients get admitted to the uh, lead trauma hospital when they meet this criteria. Exactly. If you just come in on step two alone, 80%, 86% of the time, you're going to need admission to your center. It's funny because we were joking with this earlier. I don't know how many people in step two I'd ever sent home that I actually recognize. Let's say, yeah. I hope I didn't send you know, home paralysis or open to script to press skull fracture. That would be a bad one to miss. <laughs> Amputation. <laughs> it's a bit awkward. Okay, I don't know why he's limping, but... Anyway, moving on. Off you go. <laughs> so I think we touched on it here a little bit. Is what is the uh, purpose of the air ambulance utilization standard, and how does this fit with the uh, the field trauma triage standard? And really, what the air ambulance utilization standard is is that it's trying to provide prompt transport and to the most appropriate facility. So in essence, it's a time factor. And we're lucky we're living in a in a province like Ontario where we have a a robust air ambulance program where we can actually rely upon this for specific indications. That being said, we don't. We, it's a limited resource and we have to use it appropriately for the right indications and that's why having a, a joint statement released with the air ambulance utilization standard along with the field trauma triage standard, although they're now separate, releasing them together makes a lot of sense and as, as we move through our presentation today, I, I hope that you'll be able to see why they're linked. Absolutely. Now using an air ambulance program is actually there's evidence to sort of support that as well. This article came out in the Journal of American uh, Medical, the Journal of American, American Medical Association, which showed there is an association between helicopter versus ground emergency medical services and survival for adults with major trauma. But it's only like a small number, isn't it? Well, like, it's a small number. It's, yeah. it's, it's uh, 223,000 patients. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I can count that. I don't think I can, sure. <laughs> so if you look at that, these are, these are 223,000 patients greater than 15 years of age, and it's a retrospective trauma registry review. And yet again, here's that same number, ISS greater than 15, transported to US level 1 or level 2 trauma hospitals. And they use very soft outcomes. They looked at survival. And discharge. <laughs> and discharge. Do you who, go home? Who lived and who died and who went home? <laughs> so, soft, soft. Soft. So they use a, a, a technique called propensity, propensity score matched multivariate regression model to use to compare groups. Now, How do you say that before lunch? I know. Well, what I did is I actually took that like any clinician because you and I, we're eMERGE docs, right? Yeah. So we're like, that that sounds impressive. <laughs> so let's go talk to someone who knows what that means and see exactly. what they mean. So we did. We went to our our colleagues who have uh, master's degrees in epidemiology from Western University where we work and say, you know, help us understand what this actually means. And by and large, it's actually a fairly sound methodology. Yeah. And I guess that sort of fits as to why it's published in JAMA. Makes sense. So let's 
let's take a look at some of the findings of this of this paper. It's um, results are for level the, the results for the patients that were transported to a level one lead trauma hospital is that helicopter transport was associated with an improved odds of survival compared to ground transport. But you look at the odds ratios; it's not necessarily as strong as some of the step one and step two evidence we right. have from the uh, from the guidelines. But there is a benefit there, um, and the absolute risk reduction is about one point five percent. So small, but nevertheless present. But it's there. And uh, and more importantly, what I like the numbers is the number needed to treat. So for every exactly. life saved, you need to transport 65 patients. And I, I think we should talk about the cost associated with this. So you're absolutely right. It is expensive to fly people using helicopter EMS. Um, it is exp it is it is um, it's an expensive resource. It's a scarce resource, so we have to use it in the right indications. Absolutely, and that's why having a, appropriate guidelines which are evidence based and also vetted by all the different partners. So we have taken these guidelines and talked to the Ontario Trauma Association. We talked to the um, Orange uh, Group. We have talked to the uh, Ontario Association of Paramedic Chiefs, the operations experts, and we talked to the base hospital group who have some of the medical knowledge and said. Do you think these make sense based on the best available evidence? And we've involved the ministry to say, does this fit with regard to your mission planning for each individual base? Um, and we figured that some of these costs are actually fixed, fixed costs as well. Yeah. The, the helicopters are there, they're staffed you know, with expert pilots as well as with paramedics. So when do we use them? Uh, we use them when indicated by these guidelines and, and there is a mortality save as we can see. <clears throat> exactly, and I mean when you look at it, it, there is benefit. So if you look at transported to level one uh, trauma hospitals, discharged to either a rehab facility or to an intermediate facility, there are st statistically significant improvements there. Yeah. Right? You're looking at 18.2 to 12.7. So when they're at a level one trauma hospital. So our, our issue is to be able to find out where should we appropriately utilize the aircraft? Because right? that benefit, if there is one there, as we can see, is going to fall off markedly when uh, we use it inappropriately. Exactly. So just on that, the appropriate and safe utilization of helicopter emergency medical services, there's, there's a joint statement which came out, which, is, uh, which came out in the pre-hospital emergency care in 2013. And what it basically talked about was that Medical helicopters are actually a treatment in and of themselves. Exactly. So what is it that actually shows us this, this association with an improved survival? And really what it is, it's time. It's manipulating time. Right. So it's time to reach definitive care, it's time to receive critical interventions, and it's time to match a very complicated patient to a higher level of care and to match that same level of care to be provided during that transport. So if we're able to bring patients to trauma centers or bring patients to the right definitive care center faster than we're able to go by ground, that is where we believe we're finding the mortality safe. Exactly. So yeah. that we've all been in the back of 139 in Augustus, and I don't think there's a lot of life-saving things that the actual machine brings. It's no. The people inside, it's the time that we can provide and the time to definitive care that makes the difference. Agreed. And so what is this time to definitive care and why do we keep talking about having the trauma hospitals? Well, we know that based on the literature, and this came out in the Journal of Trauma, that an organized trauma system, meaning excellent pre-hospital care, ground, excellent pre-hospital care, air, and then having organized trauma teams and trauma systems leads to a mortality reduction. Absolutely. And later on, we will talk a little bit about just trauma systems from a hospital perspective. and but. Overall, the entire system, if you have a good, excellent pre-hospital air and trauma system, 15% reduction in mortality. And let's remember, in Ontario, the vast majority of patients going to trauma centers go by ground. Yeah. There's, there's a very few air uh, ambulances out there, and even when there is one, it may be occupied with another call. So therefore, the vast majority of our transports go by ground, and that's why they are one of the most important factors for our community-based um, pre-hospital care trauma network that we have, which is forms such an integral amount of our organized trauma system. And that's how we realize this 15% reduction in mortality. Absolutely. So finally, they came based on the importance of time and based upon the evidence that's out there supporting the use of air ambulance, there came out recommendations earlier this year which showed here's the best evidence guide guideline for air medical transport of pre-hospital trauma patients. And so, what do these guidelines suggest? They recommended that you should first use an organized field trauma triage criteria to decide 
who are the patients that most injured who should go to a level one trauma center? Well, that is exactly what the field trauma trio standard is. It's exactly what it is, and that's exactly what we're here to talk about today. And so they recommend that helicopter EMS be used to transport patients meeting these criteria and bring them to an appropriate trauma center if there's a significant time savings. Exactly. So where, what have we done in Ontario? We have taken just that and incorporated the time factors into our operational guidelines in the air ambulance utilization standard. And what this says is the land ambulance requires more than 30 minutes to reach the scene and if air ambulance can reach the scene quicker or if the land ambulance requires more than 30 minutes to travel from the scene to the closest appropriate hospital and the air ambulance can reach the scene and transport the patient to the closest appropriate hospital quicker or if the estimated response for both land and air is greater than 30 minutes but approximately equal and the patient needs advanced paramedic level which cannot be provided in the responding land ambulance is reasonable or if there's multiple casualties and their local resources are overwhelmed. Now that I find confusing. So Mike, how are we going to remember these criteria when you're out there and with all these things running through your mind as a paramedic first responder going into a multiple trauma situation, how are you going to remember these different factors? Yeah, I mean, I agree. Trying to remember those long lines and, and I mean, I have this printed so that I can remember them. But for me, it boils down to, you know, is it going to be quicker to the scene? You know, is the helicopter going to be quicker to the scene? Is it going to be quicker to definitive care, mm, right? Okay. Getting them to the hospital. Is it bringing an additional resource that is required for that patient? Or are we looking at, you know, an MCI scenario where, you know, the local resources are just overwhelmed? So that's kind of how I simplify it in my head to remember. So the way you're looking at it from the patient's perspective, if you're the injured patient on the ground, patient on the ground, you're thinking, what's the fastest thing to get me to get to here? Yep. To get to me. What's the thing fastest thing to get me to where I need to go? Yep. Um, and or if, hey, I'm injured, but so those other seven other people injured. Uh, paramedic over here, please help me. <laughs> Can I have some help too. <laughs> so it's another resource to bring. That makes a lot of sense. I like exactly. that one. And, and this brings it back to the whole idea of mission profile. Great, and, uh, and that's a great idea. That's, a, that's another initiative what we're having. So much like we have the field trauma triage guidelines or standard out there, and we're dovetailing that with the air ambulance utilization standard, there's work now happening with, the, with our orange partners who are going to each individual base yeah. and saying, hey, look, um, in our base with these limited geographics or these limitations based on our deployment plans from our EMS partners, our land EMS partners, where should we be responding and when should we be calling and, and recognizing that each individual base has unique profiles. So there's work underway in Ottawa as well as um, uh, in London and I know that Kenora is looking at these different deployment plans. So as a disclaimer, it's important to know that although this is the provincial documents, your local patient priority system can alter these local documents based on your regional need. And I know there's subtle variations to this program, both in uh, underway in Ottawa, as well as Kenora, as well as in London that we're working on here. So it's important that although these are provincial documents, know your local mission profile as well and your local deployment plan. Okay, so with that being said, let's move on to some of the questions that we've received from our paramedics and, um, and get a sort of sense as to where the need is in terms of uh, some of their specific learning needs. So, what is the definition of a lead trauma hospital? And you can provide a list of them within the province. So looking at, uh, you know, the lead trauma hospitals, they're, uh, they're spaced out all over Ontario. Um, Before we do this, Mike, let's put the disclaimer out that if we forget one, we're sorry. And we, yes, we do <laughs> apologize. We do apologize. It's not for any lack of trying to remember. Uh, so we've got uh, St. Mike's and Sunnybrook in Toronto. Uh, then uh, we've got Sudbury, Thunder Bay, Ottawa, Kingston, Hamilton, London, and Windsor. I think I think that's it. I think that's it. If we forget if we forget anyone, we apologize. We apologize and feel free to put your hand up and <laughs> tell us that we forgot so we can update that list. Exactly, good. So but I guess the that still comes back to well what does a level one designation mean? Like what is a lead trauma hospital? Great. So in the years past we've heard topics of I'm a level one, I'm a level two, I'm a right. level three, I'm a level four. And so um, recently, um, the Critical Care Services Ontario, the CCSO, led by Dr. Bernard Lawless, uh, who is a trauma team uh, specialist and a general surgeon out of uh, St. Mike's and a classmate of mine, um, we've revamped how the trauma, well, they have revamped how the trauma networks work in Ontario. 
And what essentially we're looking at is what's called a hub and spoke model that extends out from each individual lead trauma hospital. And therefore, the lead trauma hospitals, those centers we mentioned, know that there are feeder hospitals that send them to trauma patients. We used to designate different hospitals as level two, level three, level four, based on the Trauma Association of Canada guidelines, which says, based on these resources that you must have to qualify as a lead two, three, and four, this is how you arrive at that number. Okay. Well, what's happened recently is there's a now a movement afoot to credential not just the local hospitals by Accreditation Canada. What they do is they come in and say, this is your lead trauma hospital. We're going to accredit your system. And so your lead trauma hospital, London, for instance, your system involves these are four or five or eight or ten other feeder hospitals that will send your trauma patients to you. Internally, we can actually designate those hospitals in our own regional geographic. So outside of London, we can say, these are the ten hospitals that tend to feed us patients based on their resources, based on these guidelines. These are the two, three, or four, and they contribute to our system. Mm -hmm. But to become a, um, a accredited or a, a pro trauma program of distinction, they call them, they, the Accreditation Canada comes into the lead trauma hospital and accredits your system. So the old way of numbering different hospitals as part of a provincial network is, is more passe. Now what we actually have is credentialing of um, and de defining programs of distinction that have feeder hospitals that internally may have self-designated themselves by those numbers. Bringing it right back to the whole idea that it's the trauma system that improves mortality, not the trauma hospital. Exactly. So this is where we have lead trauma hospitals, and then your work comes from the lead trauma hospital building out in your community around you is to know what are the capabilities and the capacities of those local hospitals that may or may not self-designate themselves with those numbers, but what gets credentialed is the system. Right. Okay. Right. That's a really important sort of... Uh, uh, concept and that's a new change to the concept but the most important thing is knowing in the system that you work um, what is a lead trauma hospital. So if you work in a system that is not close to a lead trauma hospital one of the first questions we have is do any of these guidelines still apply to me? Yeah, and I think that rolls very nicely into the next question that we have which is you know what do I do if I'm not near a lead trauma hospital? So what are the options? Well for me I think of all the questions, this is probably one of the most important questions. Yeah. Because initially I was thinking, if you read the trauma triage standard, it says that you transport these patients, meaning step one and step two, preferentially to a lead trauma hospital that's less than 30 minutes. So I can see if I was a paramedic, I would go, well, I don't live close to within 30 minutes of lead trauma hospital, so these don't apply to me. And that's a reasonable question, a reasonable exactly. thought. But in reality, this is exactly who we're trying to target. Yeah. Because if you don't live within a 30-minute drive from the, um, from the lead trauma hospital, these are the patients that you need to be able to look at and go, this person does meet step one, step two. I can't drive to the local hospital, but I know that they're ultimately the ultimate patient journey. And this is a concept we want to get across to you today is if you're the paramedic that's there with the patient, think of what their ultimate destination is going to be. If their ultimate destination, look at this guy's super injured, and I'm going to this local hospital where I know there's no surgical capability, there's no blood available, there's no CAT scanner, I, I watched them try to intubate someone awfully for about 40 minutes once. Um, this is not where this person's going to wind up being. If you hear the area this is on the route, keep them coming or activate them because you know that the ultimate patient journey is going to be at the lead trauma hospital. Exactly. So if there's anyone out there that the actual um, field trauma triage standard and the air ambulance utilization standard is most important to target, it, are, it's, it is those paramedics that are working in environments that are further from the lead trauma hospital. Exactly. And that I love the concept of the ultimate patient journey. And you'll hear us use that term a few times today because it's such an important part of the entire system. So what is it different? What is different between the last edition of the field trauma triage guidelines and the new ones in terms of transport time and extrication time? Well, I, I mean, ultimately, the one big change from uh, transport time, extrication time, is now transport time does not include that extrication time. Mm. So it's not about how long it takes to get them out. It is once they're out and you are ready to roll, ready to go, can you get to that lead trauma hospital in 30 minutes? And there's lots of things that come into that play, right? That can change based on weather. That can be changed based on road availability, like mm -hmm. it's it's knowing your local area and knowing a lot about the factors that can affect how fast you can drive and move from one place to another. Exactly, and none of us are going to stand there retrospectively with a stopwatch and go, aha! <laughs> it's a, <laughs> 31. It's a decision, like, uh, it's a decision you have to make there, honestly. Your decision is going to be, 
based on what's happening right now, can I drive to Lee Tremble Hospital in less than 30 minutes? If you can, great. Um, but we do not include extrication time now, which is important. And that 30 minutes is important because that's also where we're seeing some of the mission profiles for some bases develop out of Orange, is that we're saying, okay, well, we know that if you can drive directly to the land, to the Lee Trauma Hospital within 30 minutes, you can do that by your guidelines now. Well, then sending Orange necessarily within a 30-minute radius may not make that much sense. So exactly. that's why we're seeing in some areas um, um, a, a change to the mission profile recognizing there are some areas with unique geographics, Kenora being an example, where you may be within that time window, but we still need to lunch. Um, yeah. And there are other areas within the province. So that's why knowing your own uh, local uh, patient priority system and your own deployment plans are really important. It's going to be critical. So if I have a patient that who meets step one or step two, but I suspect they are unlikely to survive to the transport to the lead trauma hospital, what should I do? I think then you need to go to the local emergency department, the closest hospital, because there may be interventions that they can do briefly, intubate, chest tube, blood if it's available, um, that can stabilize that patient in the short term. So although step one and step two are defined, designed to be able to find the most injured patients, yep. um, it, you very well could be relatively stable with some of those indications, and therefore it's fine by up to 30 minutes. Absolutely. But you may find that this person is moribund and gasping for breath and, you, and, and looks as part of the load and go standard we see in our basic life support patient care standards. This person is just not going to survive transport to the lead trauma hospital, then you have that ability as a paramedic to use, use your judgment and go, we're going to the local hospital. Yep. There may be a couple interventions they can do at that local hospital that they can stabilize them and then bring them to the lead trauma hospital. Exactly. There is an exception here. Though. What's that? Penetrating. And penet why is that? Why do we have an exception for penetrating trauma? Well, penetrating trauma in and of itself, there is, is a unique type of trauma that requires Specialized surgical intervention, I think, is probably the best way to look at it, mm -hmm. in that in those patients, the chance of a small community hospital being able to provide that specialized thoracic surgical intervention is small. So if you're stabbed and you have a hole and there's blood pouring out of that hole, you need surgery. Exactly. And your time to surgery is probably faster at a lead trauma hospital. So it's better than to, to if you can drive there with up to 30 minutes, under 30 minutes, you're probably better at investing that time driving to the lead trauma hospital if it's under 30 minutes, even if they are uh, if it's penetrating trauma, because the chances that we can get the, the OR up and ready and going is probably faster than if you drive maybe 15 minutes to the local eMERGE and then they have to then scramble to find the surgeon. And they actually may not have a surgeon exactly. um, or that surgeon's at home, whereas we have surgeons in-house in level A, uh, level one trauma centers, we can just start an A case, bring the OR and open them up. So, you're better off investing that time in the pre-hospital phase, driving a little bit longer to get to a lead trauma hospital with surgical capability in penetrating trauma. Exactly. Okay, good. So that's an important distinction to make. And it's interesting to note that that's not a new change. That's generated a lot of controversy, but that was in the old guidelines That was the old too. guidelines, yeah. exactly. So that's not changed. Um, yeah. Okay. So why does step two state that penetrating trauma should be brought to the lead trauma hospital according to the 30-minute transport? Isn't that contrary to the closest ED rule? I think we just answered that. Yeah. I hope we just I answered think, that. I think we did, hopefully. Okay. So for patients who meet step one or two of the field trauma trio standard, where the lead trauma hospital is greater than a 30-minute drive away and is also not the closest hospital from my location, should I request the air ambulance? Sure. It makes sense. They meet step one, step two. The lead trauma hospital is not your closest hospital, nor is it within your 30-minute drive. So you're going to be going to a local eMERGE. So, so in fact, that is, in essence, exactly who we're hoping to be able to activate the air ambulance for. You exactly. have a patient that is, that is, by definition, by meeting step one, step two, is critically injured. Um, we know it's a long drive to lead trauma hospital. So therefore, if we think there's going to be a time savings by activating the air ambulance, bring them in and have them transported to the lead trauma hospital. Exactly. These are exactly who we're trying to act, uh, trying to reach. So do I still follow my trauma, trauma cardiac arrest medical directive when indicated, when indicated patch for TOR? So do the field trauma triage guidelines really change uh, your TOR rules? Great. So one of the one concepts we also want to get across to all paramedics here is that there's nothing in here that we're going to be talking about today that necessarily contravenes your medical directives. So if a patient meets the indications as listed in your advanced life support patient care standard, 
um, medical directive for traumatic cardiac arrest, if they meet the TOR guidelines, you follow those TOR guidelines. Mm -hmm. What will happen is, what do you do with the patient if they don't meet the TOR guidelines, sorry, they do meet the TOR guidelines, but then a TOR is not granted for whatever reason by the base hospital physician or the past physician? Yeah. Then that would probably be closest hospital. Exactly. But you still follow your TOR medical directives as they are because there's nothing in the BLS patient care standards we're talking about today that contravenes the ALS PCS. We've really worked hard at trying to make sure that they are complementary and they're synergistic but not competing against each other. Exactly, and I think that leads very well to this next question that we have, which is, if it's not authorized, where do I go? And that would be, you have someone who is unlikely to survive the transport to the lead trauma hospital, therefore you go to the closest hospital. Exactly. Except, Except in penetrating except trauma. In penetrating trauma. Pen regardless of vital signs, penetrating trauma goes to the lead trauma hospital if it's in less than 30 minutes recognizing that, yet again, it's not a new change. That's always been there. Exactly. So although it's seeming, for some reason, generating all kinds of controversy, well, it should have been generating controversy <laughs> since 2007. Exactly. That's that was out. when it was last updated. Awesome. Good. Exactly. Okay. So not a new change there. So if I'm transporting to the lead trauma hospital, should I patch ahead and tell them to activate the trauma team? This is what happened to us, actually. One yeah. day I was actually in the eMERGE and the patch phone rang and, and it's, um, our medics are on board and they're saying, get the trauma team, we're coming in with a, field trauma, with a person that meets the field trauma triage guidelines. And it's important to know that the mechanism by which each individual ED activates the trauma team will differ across the province. Exactly. And that is the key point to remember is that it, it is a local policy, it's a hospital policy, whether or not you want to activate your trauma team based on the pre-hospital sort of land EMS patient assessment. Right, so some, may, some hospitals may have the trauma team leader in-house. Some hospitals may have the trauma team leader out of the hospital and waiting for their calls. So potentially you may have someone that meets step two, which is a trauma patient with a blood pressure less than 90, or maybe they have a GCS less than 14. Well, we may wind up having over triage if every single time we have a field trauma triage guideline patient who then comes to the trauma hospital activating the CTL. So therefore, they come to the local hospital, they come to the lead trauma hospital ED, mm -hmm. and then the ED team knows their own indications to consult the um, trauma team. Exactly. And so it's important to know your local policies in that regard. Yeah. There may be systems in Ontario that we're not familiar with from our vantage point that have it such that the field uh, medics can actually activate the trauma team. Um, and if that's, that's your local policy, great. Um, but certainly that's not necessarily a universal policy. Um, now, an exception to this, which we'll talk about in a bit, is when we're all dealing with modified scenes and scene responses via Orange. And right. we definitely know that that's a different model that has where both Mike and I work as uh, past physicians with Orange, where we're the quote-unquote doc in the box uh, talking to the air crews. So when that happens, we actually can radio ahead uh, to the lead trauma hospital and talk to the TTL directly give them advice as to what the ETA is what with their inbound patient, and also talk about the procedures that are on route and how they meet the field trauma triage guidelines, and then they can automatically accept. We still, however, notify the, uh, the eMERGE about our entry as well, because of the fact that oftentimes these patients will arrive, based on the short flight times, arrive the, uh, the ED before the TTL can actually get in from home. Exactly. So, Mike, and this is a really important concept, is if a patient meets step three and step four, should we be going to lead trauma hospital? And for me, um, this is where we could easily get into some of the over triage situations. Absolutely. So I know that similar to step one and step two, where you actually had some numbers looking at the um, rates and how they correlate to ISS, I know you're going to talk about that yep. in a moment. But for me, uh, what I really want to get across from my vantage point is steps three and steps four are designed to identify patients who are at higher risk of severe injury. They may not be initially apparent on primary evaluation. So it's not an automatic decision to transport these patients to the lead trauma hospital. Doing so could result in significant over triage of, of trauma patients to the lead trauma hospital. So paramedics need to use their judgment and it's required um, and you also need to balance that judgment against how perhaps these trauma standards have been modified by your patient priority system bypass agreements. So it may be that ultimately many of these patients may require eventual transfer to a lead trauma hospital for more sophisticated investigations that may be not readily available to close to CDs. However, this does not necessarily mean that paramedics should transport these patients to a lead trauma hospital. So bottom line, if a patient meets only steps three and four, generally these patients will be transported to the closest ED 
we're going to talk about some of the nuances about that as to whether or not you should keep the air ambulance going for these patients or, or, or should you patch the base hospital physician. So if there is significant concern, the patient should be brought directly to the lead trauma hospital underneath the 30-minute window. There is always the option to patch, but I know that it's still going to be a local determination as to how that the step three and step four roll out. Given that, I know that um, some systems don't want extra patches for every step three and step four. So just because you have a burn patient, for instance, doesn't mean that you now call and say, should I be going to the lead trauma hospital? Know your local policies. Now, Mike, if you go through um, step three and step four, like what are some of the numbers that we're looking at? So there are definitely some numbers there that we can, um, that we can talk about. And next, there we go. Yeah, so and this is exactly what Mike was talking about in the whole idea of over triage and not overburdening the system. So if you look at, now obviously some of these numbers don't perfectly match with the current systems, uh, but you know, prolonged extrication times, falls greater than 15 feet, some of those are sort of 50-50 or close to 50-50 in whether or not it's an appropriate triage to a lead trauma hospital or an over triage. Mm. You know, death of an occupant, uh, death of an occupant in the same vehicle, you know, that's pretty well associated with very good uh, appropriate triage, but there's still 16% of the time it, it's mm -hmm. going to be over triaging these patients. So if you're using these criteria all the time, as your reason to bring people to the hospital, you're going to be bringing a lot of people that, well, it's great that they're at the trauma center, you're going to be overutilizing that resource and overburdening that resource potentially mm. uh, for the patients that they really need to be there for, which is, you know, the patients with the ISS greater than 50. Same thing when you look at the age-specific criteria. There's no doubt that as you get older, if you are injured, your mortality goes up mm -hmm. um, with the same injuries. However, um, you know, it's, it's relative. You still need to use that paramedic judgment to make a decision as to whether or not that one patient needs to go to the trauma hospital at that time. So if I'm looking for a take-home message, the take-home message for me would be, um, as a paramedic, is step one, step two goes to the trauma hospital. Step three, step four, I have to consider the patient journey. Are they ultimately going to wind up coming to a lead trauma hospital? If so, yes. Okay, well then um, I am going to still go to my local hospital for step three and step four, but if I hear that the air ambulance is coming, I probably should keep them coming on this call because I know that knowing the hospital I'm transporting to, they probably don't have a CAT scanner, they probably don't have blood, this person's got a mechanism of injury which is very concerning, they're putting in some more investigations. Maybe this person uh, will ultimately require a lead trauma hospital and maybe I'm going to be the paramedic that's going to be driving them anyway. So if I hear the ambulance is coming, not to cancel. But then again, I think from an orange perspective, those paramedics also need to be able to realize that if you're the inbound flight crew and you hear FTTGs are not met, why are they still making me come and they're still requesting me? I think that we need to be, uh, as orange, need to be a little bit more balanced and be able to say, okay, I understand exactly why you kept me coming because it sounds like I'm going to be coming back. If you cancel me, I go back to base, then all of a sudden the doc that's in that center reactivates and asks for an interfacility now. Well, now I'm having to turn right back around and go again. Um, these false launches, every time we launch, it's expensive. Yep. But more importantly, there is a calculated risk every time we launch an aircraft. And what we were trying to do is be able to figure out what's the safest way to launch your aircraft. Let's not launch them three times for the same patient, which we see. Um, exactly. So let's have a more rational use of that. And we're going to touch on that a little bit when we talk about this question. So I recently transported a trauma patient who did not meet the current field trauma triage guidelines from the scene to the closest ED. So he did the right thing. An hour later, I then transferred the patient to the lead trauma hospital. So when does the ED decide to transfer a patient to a lead trauma hospital, and why are those indications different than the field trauma triage guidelines, which is an excellent question. That's a great question, and really it comes down to the trauma consultation guidelines for ED physicians, um, which can be found at the Critical Care Services Ontario website, but we'll put them up here. And when you look at them, you know, the anatomic, the physiologic, special considerations, they all line up pretty well with yeah. the FTTS, right? They're very similar uh, to that, which makes sense. You know, if they're meeting step one or step two, you know, they're, they're going to want to send them to the, the lead trauma hospital. But I think the key part is the systems. Yeah. And when you read carefully, you know, requiring trauma cons consultation requires more care than can be provided at the referring center based on the assessment of the ED physician. And that's really about knowing your system, knowing where you're bringing this patient and what is available to manage that patient there. 
Great. So a good example would be, for instance, um, you are that, um, let's see, you are that, let's do that position at that local ED and you recognize this person's had a significant injury, but yet they're not unstable by, by your uh, physiological pro, uh, step and by your anatomical step, step two, but yet they have an injury that you require a CAT scan for. So it could be something simple as I fell, I've got significant left upper quadrant pain and um, my vitals are stable, but my pain is of the nature that I really think this person could have a ruptured spleen. That person, by the systems criteria of the trauma interfacility transfer criteria, may require more care than can be provided at the referring center based on the assessment of that ED physician. Therefore, it needs to go. Exactly. And that very well could be why your um, uh, as, as the paramedic in this question, had to transport that same patient back out of that hospital to lead trauma hospital because they needed those investigations. We've had a couple of recent cases where you and I have been working um, in the box for orange and where we've had um, land paramedics that responded to a, a patient with a significant mechanism of injury. So they met the criteria for, for some of the, the mechanism-based approaches in step three and step four. Yes but nevertheless did not meet the anatomic or physiologic criteria. For instance, someone who had a significant fall or someone who actually had a death in the same passenger compartment. Um, one of my patients actually that I had was a patient who was anticoagulated and over the age of 55. And he was actually had a, uh, um, a fairly significant mechanism with regard to their, their um, car, uh, actually, it was actually a tractor rollover. Um, and, but they did not meet the physiologic or anatomic and then therefore the paramedics cancel the air ambulance which is inbound. So then what happened is the patient goes to the local hospital, he's anticoagulated, he's over the age of 55, and he's had a significant mechanism but was not severely injured by the step one, step two, he was missed by those. Therefore what happened is eventually he had a ruptured spleen, a ruptured diaphragm, he had a hemo pneumothorax and a pelvic fracture, and he's on Coumadin in a hospital that doesn't have blood. It's not a good place, place to be. Right, and we could have been there. Eventually we had to actually launch the aircraft again, and we therefore, um, we could have made scene by 1830, we didn't make scenes of 2240 because of weather and other logistics and other pieces and so the time to definitive care for that patient was enormous. Yeah. So therefore it's important to consider the patient journey and if you know your system best and you're that land medic sitting there with your majorly injured patient, knowing that they meet step three and step four and knowing that you're going to that small hospital without blood and without a CAT scanner and with one doc, Maybe you think, you know what, I hear the air ambulance is coming, I've got a high suspicion I'm going to be the guy that's transporting this person out of here on land uh, two hours down the road to Lee Trumbull Hospital, keep them coming. And then, but Orange, if you land for those cases, you need to be patient and say, I understand why you kept me coming. And we'll talk about a couple other cases, how you can manage that over triage concept. Exactly, and I think that flows very well into this next question, which is all about canceling. And both myself and Mike working in the box, we see a lot of cancels. And, you know, sometimes that's appropriate. Yeah, most and of the time. It's most of the great. time it's very appropriate. But the question is, is, you know, it's all about patient journey. And so let's talk a bit about canceling. And, and specifically, let's talk about that one case where, you know, we can talk about how can we modify the whole idea of a canceled call such that, you know, we have the patient journey in mind. Sure. So case in point, um, let's talk about um, you. We are launching as Orange to a different um to a different uh, trauma patient, we are oftentimes canceled and we get limited information back as to why we're canceled. We're canceled because field trauma triage guidelines aren't met. But then you look at the mechanism of injury and go, ah, oh, it's sketchy, I don't know, we're probably going to wind up having to go back, or we actually don't go back, which may be worse, because then some uh, land paramedic then has to do a two and a half hour transport out of region, and you think about this from a municipality utilization rate, maybe it's at three o'clock in the morning, and it's um, you have three or four vehicles providing coverage to the entire municipality, and now you're taking one of your vehicles out at 3 in the morning, driving down this Code 4 transport through very dangerous sort of roads in the middle of the night, um, and now that municipality only has three ambulances left, and we could have actually made scene and transported them out, and you could have kept your deployment plan in that municipality um, stable, and then we could have, we were basically an additional resource. Exactly. So um, one of the cases I was involved in where this actually worked well was um, a patient did not meet field trauma triage guidelines, but the Ottawa machine was actually flying out to a place called Barry's Bay. So land medics in Barry's Bay requested um, uh, air ambulance. They were launched. Uh, when the land medics made patient contact, the patient did not meet the field trauma triage guidelines. But nevertheless, the, uh, we were on scene, and the medics uh, on both sides recognized one key important thing, the patient journey. They recognized, look, I've seen lots of patients go into Barry's Bay with this fall. It was a fall off a cliff face. They were completely stable, but they had a significant mechanism of injury. So 
therefore they did not meet step one, step two, but the land medics and the air medics said, look, these guys are going to ultimately need to come to Ottawa. So they talked to us in the dock in the box, they talked to me in the dock in the box. I called ahead to the actual emergency physician and said, look, this is coming to you because you're the closest hospital and we can't automatically take them to the lead trauma hospital based on the field trauma treaters guidelines. Right. But we are more than happy as an emergency physician, I know you and you know this person is going to need a CAT scan and a big workup. We are more than happy to take them, um, but you need to call critical and go through the appropriate interfacility guidelines because we haven't met the field trauma treaters guidelines. But you can make, transport them as an interfacility based on these trauma center consultation guidelines. Exactly. You need a CT. So our air medics went with the land medics into Barry's Bay. The ED physician assessed them and said, yeah, I'm concerned about a spleen, I'm concerned about a sleep spine, he needs some CT images, plus he needs a CT of his head, no problem. They call trauma, trauma says absolutely send to us, they meet the trauma center consultation guidelines. We loaded them in the aircraft and went. So in my mind, that is a good use of how step three and step four work for trauma center consultation when the field trauma triage guidelines are not met. Exactly. All about just understanding that patient journey in this uh, setting and in the area where you work. And that's going to be very different for every single case, every single region. Um, but it's, it's really important to, to know how your local areas work, the resources that you have such that, you know, ultimately we can do the systems approach to right. it. And so the, the, the concept that the, our land medics need to endorse is the patient journey concept for steps three and step four and the utilization of the aircraft and the concept that our air paramedics have to come up with is the fact that if we land and field trauma triage guidelines aren't met, fine. We had to be very patient. We had to thank them for thank the land medics for activating us, and then also recognize that we still may still need to transport them as for the as for the interfacility guidelines. And I think that that's how we need to provide cohesive, on the ground cooperation between land and air. Exactly. Systems of care. Excellent. So, regarding step four, does it infer that any trauma patient over the age of 55 meets the FTTGs? So, if a paramedic uses their judgment and doesn't transport a 60 year old to a trauma center. And it turns out they did have an occult injury. Would the paramedics be held liable because this patient met the guidelines? Well, I think we talked about steps three and steps four are concepts as to who may ultimately require a lead trauma hospital, but we're going to have way too much over triage if we use just three and four. Yes. So, so in this situation, no. no, I don't think so. I, you're not going to be, and I don't want to, I want to get away from like being held liable or exactly. being punished or being whatever the, the concept is. The, the issue here is, Recognize that this person may eventually need to leave trauma hospital. Consider if the area miss is on route. If you're really concerned, maybe keep them coming. You don't have to. Uh, you're fine to cancel them if you don't meet step one and step two. But if you think the person ultimately going to your local hospital may need lead trauma hospital, it's reasonable to keep them coming. And remember, Mike, you and I can always cancel, um, and, or not cancel, but we can actually, if there's a higher priority call, if we're looking at this call and we know that, for instance, the London machine is on route or the Sudbury machine is on route to one facility, and it sounds like this person is not, Field trauma triage guidelines are not met, um, but in, in our estimation, they're probably not going to need to go into a lead trauma hospital, and there's a more pressing call, we can always divert, we can exactly. triage away. And that's, we're asked to do that regularly, is to review the various calls that are going on and decide what, what call requires uh, the, that one resource being the air ambulance uh, at that time. And so sometimes that is to still go into this uh, to the hospital and assess these patients that may not, they don't meet step one, two, but may in their ultimate patient journey need to come or not come. Uh, but it's all about, you know, utilizing that resource as best we can. Ideally. So another step three or step four issue, or sorry, that's the step two issue, is when referring to paralysis, does that mean any extremity, paraplegia, paresthesia, or full paralysis? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, ultimately, it refers to paralysis. So a level you can't move below, feel below. But I think, as with all things, you have to take some consideration as to, you know, if you have severe dysesthesias or paresis to an extremity and your local facility doesn't have the resources to work that up, mm -hmm. you need to consider the patient journey, the mm -hmm. ultimate patient journey. I had a case, um, uh, there was a uh, skydiver, um, it was actually a paratrooper that was actually caught on high tension wires. And therefore they, when they're stuck up in high tension wires, it was a nighttime dive, and they were up there and they were screaming they couldn't feel their legs. It was an hour and a half extrication to get them off the, uh, the, uh, the high tension wires. So we triage that, because we have limited patient resources, limited patient information to know, and it sounds like the field trauma triage guidelines are met. 
although um, initially you think, well, it's a burn because the person's got significant burns, and that's step four and does not actually require an automatic lead from a hospital, you could also consider the mechanism of injury. Use a skydiver that landed on top of high tension wires. As it turned out, this patient unfortunately had burns as well as significant injuries which required um, lead trauma hospital. So it's important to not just rely based on just step three and step four to say, ah, this is not going to require lead trauma hospital. It, it potentially could have significant injury. Exactly. Oh, I, lo I love this question. This is a great question. So when assessing the severity of an MVC, must telemetry data come from the computer in the vehicle or can you use judgment? based on the scene to determine high-risk injuries. So you know you're on the 401 or you're on a, a country highway, you know, what do you think? So I love this question and, and we were actually under some pressure to actually remove the vehicle telemetry data out of the field from a TRIO standard because it, it's not necessarily everywhere. But um, I'm not sure if anyone notices, but sometimes it takes a while to change standards. Yes, <laughs> so, just a little. So therefore, maybe it's important to keep it in here in case the technology actually moves faster than our standard. Exactly. And there's some remarkable technology out there in some vehicles now that actually, if you are in a collision and there's a significant amount of impact to your actual vehicle, your vehicle can measure and quantify that actual intrusion, the amount of damage, and the relative decrease to your velocity, so how fast you stopped, and they can actually transmit that data directly to some call centers and they can activate 911. And there's some fascinating research that can actually correlate the degree of damage to your vehicle and the location of the vehicle directly to your ISS, to your injury severity score. So potentially the way it can work in the future is you're motoring down the road in your vehicle, you launch off the road because you try to avoid a deer, you strike a tree, your car calls the CAC center and said impact, driver's side, 80 kilometer hour D cell, this degree of intrusion, likelihood of field trauma triage guidelines being met for step one, step two would be 70% send ambulance. Anticipated injuries would be the following based on vector analysis. Femur, pelvis, chest, it's unbelievable. I mean you and I both sat through the, the uh, the uh, talk a couple of years ago where basically it's an eMERGE physician, it was an eMERGE physician that worked for OnStar, yeah. I think it may have been, yeah. um, talking about how they've done all this computer work to figure out, you know, based on vector velocity, flips, where you were, seat belts, no seat belts, airbags, they can basically predict with some reliability what your injury is going to be. Unbelievable. So instead of you just being dispatched out of your call center as a, either as a land paramedic or an air paramedic, you're going to get, instead of saying MVC rollover 401, you're going to get this kind of information anticipated, these kind of injuries. So it's remarkable. So we've kept that in there, knowing that the, the, the pace of change with this, this technology may um, outpace the pace of change with their standards. So therefore, you may see this coming where available. And I think it's a really important piece. So to answer the specific question, though, it still falls down to your judgment. I mean, yeah. you're the one that's there. You, uh, it always strikes me what I find fascinating about EMS is that we are uh, we're immersed physicians, right? So we see them when they come in on your stretchers in our immersed department, in our house, in our room, right? Exactly. These are our patients, so we see them in the building. You see them out there, so you're the experts with the judgment, not us. Like, yeah. why? You show me the photos of your crash scene, I'm like, oh, oh. oh maybe I should have got a CAT scan. <laughs> I think I'm going to do more with that picture. <laughs> That's a, there's a study showing that, eh? When the, when the dogs saw the photos, they actually did more investigations, uh, which is reasonable. Okay, um, the field trauma triage states that patients with penetrating trauma to the torso or head and neck are to be transported to a lead trauma hospital for a higher level of surgical care, and the 30 minutes transport time rule in this case is independent of lack of vital signs. This means that should this type of patient arrest on route, paramedics should keep going to lead trauma hospital. Should the paramedics continue to pull over and perform their one rhythm analysis under the trauma cardiac arrest directive? Well, this fits very well with a question we just got oh, there we um, go. through the um, through the uh, through the webinar here that says penetrating not expected to survive trip bypass um, if the patient dies on route should I tour? And really, I, I want to make sure we're one hundred percent clear on this because yet again we mentioned how um, confusing this is. Yet it's an, it's always been in the standard. Exactly. It's not changed. So if you are a victim of penetrating trauma and you think that you're unlikely to survive or you have zero vital signs or whatever it is, you still go to the lead trauma hospital within the 30 minute window because um, we need that surgical cap capability exactly. and it's better to invest the extra 15 minutes pre-hospital versus the hours continue to get a surgical backup done in your local hospital. Yet again, remember, it's still less than 30 minutes. Yeah. But Nothing in these directives trumps your medical directives. 
So therefore, all the standards say these, these are the criteria, here's where you bring them. If your medical directive says well, consider TOR, you follow the medical directive. Exactly. If it says pull over and do one rhythm analysis, that's what your medical director says. Exactly. Yeah, so we follow our medical directors. The case, the case becomes, what do you do if the tour is denied? Or what do you do if, if for whatever reason, remember, most of these patients are going to survive to the Lee Trumbull Hospital and are going to survive um, to the closest hospital, depending yeah. on where you go. So um, it's designed to find the most highly injured. But if you arrest and you're in a small subset, you follow your medical directors. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And this is not new. No. Not a change. I hope that's clear. This is a great question we've got, and, and generally yeah. we and I had to go back and take a look at this. And it said, uh, page 1-6 in the VLS patient care standard states that paramedics should initiate transport prior to measuring vital signs that the patient meets the load and go criteria. And this standard contradicts the standard by suggesting measuring vital signs prior to making a transport decision. So which is it? You know, and I think that what we see in this question is we see a lot of black and white. Yes. And we see a lot of, I am told to do this followed by this. And I really want us to get away from this. And so we have a standard in front of us which talks about under your patient assessments and physical assessment, this is page 1.5 in the 2007 version 2.0 of the Basic Life Support Patient Care Standards. It says at the bottom of the page, um, as part of initially you do your primary survey. And then you do your general appearance level of distress. You look at uh, the C-spine. And then you do your AVPU, your alert, voice, pain, run responsive. And then upon identification of inadequate airway, breathing, or circulation, they immediately perform appropriate interventions to establish and improve the ABCs to control, control hemorrhage, those type of things, and then initiate your load and go standard. Exactly. So in my, our concept is if you see someone is obviously arresting, pre-arresting, and I always say nothing's easier in the world to run, nothing's easier to, in the world to run than a cardiac arrest because everything is exactly out there, you know exactly what to do. Yep. Nothing's harder to run in the world than pre-arrest. Pre -arrest. <laughs> <You're> like, what <laughs> am I going to do with this guy? <laughs> So if you see someone that's cyanotic and all they can say is help me and they're doing that guppy breathing, you know what? You don't need to take time to measure the vital signs. Load them, go, and do everything en route. I get yeah. that. And that's, I think, what this paramedic is trying to get at with this question. But not everyone's so obvious. And as part of this primary physical assessment, they talk about assessing the A, Bs, and Cs. Well, to me, in order to know the Cs, you've got to take a pulse rate, you've got to take a respiratory rate, and you've got to do a blood pressure. Exactly. And, and that's the C assessment is the ABCs. Exactly. And, I mean, that's our interpretation of this, obviously, but I agree, it's, it's, it's not always black and white. Yeah, so you're not wrong to load and go in someone that is pre-arresting, because you know they are pre-arresting, um, but at the same time, I think that doing a set of vital signs as part of the primary survey is also very reasonable as well. Exactly. I don't know if they're directly contradictory. So, this is an awesome question. Mm, yes. So, uh, management have expressed concern regarding the new FTT and stating that they do not feel comfortable allowing crews to bypass the closest ED or allowing multiple resources to leave the community when a MVC or MCI has occurred. Can the decision of the supervisor override the BLS FTTG guidelines? I love this question. And I think this is exactly why, well, first of all, let's talk. About, let's back up a little bit. Who is management? So management is your paramedic service, right. and your operations um, experts, the people that run your paramedic service. And to be honest, um, the basic life support patient care standards are owned, and, and, and the responsibility for the, the implementation as well as the maintenance and the auditing and compliance with falls to the paramedic service. Right. So it would be unlikely that management would be concerned with the new field trauma standard because it's their standard to implement. What we're doing today is just more supplemental education over these actual standards. Um, and also, it's important to note that management or the paramedic services are the ones who are at the table with everyone, with Orange, with OTAC, at the Ontario Trauma Advisory Committee, and also with the ministry and also with us as the base hospital program developing these standards. So all the concerns that were raised by each individual one of the stakeholders were reviewed. Uh, we, we came to consensus and these are the documents we have. So if there is some concerns raised by local paramedic services with regard to the deployments of these basic life support patient care standards, that's reasonable, but they should be adopted into their deployment plans and their patient priority systems um, in concert with their uh, ministry officials because that's how we change deployment plans. So exactly. if there is concern there or, or um, some, uh, some feel that there's some contradictions based on local need, well, sure, that can be changed in your deployment plan. Exactly. Are the new field trauma triage guidelines mandatory, uh, and what are the implications of not following them? 
Well, um, I'm going to read uh, from a memorandum from uh, Ran uh, Richard Jackson, sorry, um, that basically says these standards will be considered effective as soon as implemented locally, but no later than June 1st, 2015. All right, so these are these are standards. So yeah. when they're implemented, they are standards, and so the expectation to follow this standard will be the same expectation as following any standard, like that is in the BLS. Exactly. Excellent. It's a standard. Okay. Good. Uh, it's like like I always say with vital signs. Uh, they're so important, we call them vital. vital. <laughs> we don't call them optional signs. <laughs> they're optional, we call them optional signs. Exactly. They're so important, we call them vital. vital. <laughs> they are vital. We don't say things like, hey, good job not taking that guy's blood pressure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard that after the fact. They're so important, we call them vital. <laughs> well, this is a standard. So uh, unfortunately, when it's out there, it's a standard. It's a standard. So the guidelines change, and that's actually a good point, because we keep calling it FTTGs, and I think we've been guilty of saying yes. that, and I know that Kathy Francis from the ministry keeps telling me that it's FTTS, Field Trauma Triage Standard. Standard. She's absolutely right. I, I, I need to get away from the guideline concept and talk more about standards, which leads really well to this question, which yes. is about, did the guidelines change when on scene and landing at a provincial <laughs> park? You know what, Mike? I think we have to take a mulligan on this. Yeah. One. I, don't, I don't know the answer to this. I, I, I think that it's the same. I would, I would think it's the same. I, I don't know that it's different just because you're landing in a provincial park other yeah. than anywhere else. Yeah. Certainly there are predetermined landing sites uh, all over the uh, province. There are uh, specialized uh, helipads that have been put in uh, based on local needs and assessments. Some of them are daytimes, nighttimes, you know, depending on how they're lit and stuff. Um, but certainly uh, there are predetermined landing sites. But the pilots also have the ability, depending on uh, where something has happened and what the local uh, topography and is like, to land even closer than not at one of these landing sites. And I mean, there's lots of these landing sites all over. It's amazing to me, actually. They, they're uh, hidden amongst, uh, and this is where paramedics know their system the best. They know where those local sites are. And this is actually um, 10 years ago or even greater when I first started working um, with Orange, actually. I, did, I actually didn't even know these existed. And then one day I was out mountain biking outside of Ottawa, and I ran into a, um, a little sign by a dirt road that said um, air ambulance and an arrow. I'm like, what would this mean? So I went up this little dirt road on my mountain bike, and there was this um, helipad just outside of Ampa, right uh, in the middle of uh, Lanark County, a beautiful area of, of the province. And so right, uh, the, uh, Orange maintains these helipad sites, um, which are suitable for nighttime landing if they're cone sites or if they have lights, to be able to respond um, as required uh, as on scenes. Right. And during the day, um, we leave it to our aviation guys, but they're the ones that decide where we land. Exactly. Um, and also, there's wording in the air and utilization standard as to how to prepare a landing zone. It's important to be familiar with that as well. Um, as paramedics. So, yeah, so this was a, a great question and uh, once again it's going to be a bit of a hedge of an answer in that if the closest... Hey, we're not radiologists here. Oh, <laughs> sorry, right. <laughs> it could be. It could be a tumor. <laughs> but maybe you need to consider depending on the clinical correlation. So if the closest most appropriate hospital for a patient transfer has critical equipment down, hey, speaking of radiologists, a hey, CT scanner. Ironic. <laughs> Ironically, we talk about I that. Didn't think of that. Can the air ambulance be tiered to bring a patient to another hospital, although they don't meet trauma triage standards? Sure. So, I mean, this is going to be one of those unique situations that happens, right? As CAT scanners go down. I remember a situation where uh, St. Mike's, the helipad was down, and therefore trauma was actually diverted to the brook for that day. So there could always be unique situations that arise, which which, um, but the responsibility for that communication has to come from the hospital that has the issue, yeah. to communicate it through the CAC to their paramedic services so everyone's aware. Mm -hmm. And it's probably going to be a time-sensitive thing, a time-limited thing. Um, and so I don't know if we can write that into the standard. That'll be, have to be on a case-by-case -case notification, and I'm sure the ministry becomes aware of all those different things as well. So yeah. it's based on local need in a, in a time-limited fashion. Exactly. Okay. Great. Can the FTTS be expanded to allow CAC to tier air ambulance based on their good judgment? And that is written right into the standard. I think Mike even has it in front of him there. So, so that is in the air ambulance utilization standard in section yep. 3. They talk about other considerations. And it says if in the judgment of a paramedic or ambulance communications officer, an on-scene ambulance is respond, is, response is appropriate based on the perceived severity of the reported injuries and without confirmation that the clinical guidelines have been met, an air ambulance response may be requested. And we see this all the time in the box. Absolutely. You'll be sitting there reviewing the calls that are going on that day and you'll see on scene requested 401, 403, 407, 
and you'll have very limited information. It'll be three car MVC, you know, suspect four or six patients or right. whatever. And and so you have very limited information that that helicopter is being launched for. And it gets updated as more and more medical responders arrive at scene. But I, I think there there is a background to this. The this exists for a reason. Absolutely. And um, so years ago, we used to auto launch or have this because the calls come in from OPP or the calls come in from third parties. And they say, like, here's limited information. So we don't want to be sitting at base as air ambulance and not launching when we, we could bring our resource to bear as per the operation of clinical guidelines. But um, what happened was is that we decided maybe it's best to try and decrease our, our false launches um, by actually waiting then for a paramedic to arrive on scene and make the decision that truly the field trauma triage guidelines are met. We decided to either do that or wait up to 10 minutes. But you know, if you're a land paramedic, the last thing on your mind when you arrive a multiple casualty situation or an acute injury is to go, I gotta confirm that it's definitely indicated to have the air ambulance going, when really quite honestly, oftentimes you would know based on OPP assessment that it is indicated, like four passengers, minivan, one gasping for breath, one dead, we need to go uh, and bring your resource because there's only one ambulance in that area. That's a no-brainer we need to launch. So therefore, it's written into the standard that an ambulance communications officer can launch for trauma. And I remember back in the whole Toronto Star days, there were some headlines where it said, as I lay bleeding, orange weighted. And that, that's why we allow the judgments of the ambulance call officers now, in concert with the information we're getting from the scene, to launch for these traumas because exactly. we want to be able to use every resource. If you, if it's your family or if it's my family that's on the, on, on the side of the road with a major trauma, I want to know that every resource that the province has can be launched and brought to bear to deliver time-saving care to, the, the, to, our, to our families. These are our communities too. Exactly. And that's why we work in the system. We want this system to be working for all of us. Exactly. So how are we going to remember all of these steps? And you know what? I'll agree that all of these systems require a lot of memory. Uh, there's certainly a fair bit of information that you need to look at. And I'll be honest, when I'm working at Orange, I have this printed in my little cheat sheet book mm -hmm. next to me so that I can check things when I need to. Um, and so I think everybody should follow the same rule. I, I like checklists. I'm a, I'm a big fan of checklists. Checklists are good. So, you know, have a cheat sheet, have it in your pocket. I know that there are going to be laminated copies mm -hmm. in all of the zip bags for, for the crews, um, but you know that doesn't mean you can't put this on your Blackberry, your iPhone, your Android, whatever that device is that you carry, or you know have it in your pocket on a sheet of paper so that if you need to check it, you've got the ability to do so. I think it's great. I 100% agree with you. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so I think we need to go um, and, um, and for whatever mechanism you have, you remember the different steps, works. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I have a piece, I have one of these, you know, obviously I'm not a paramedic, so I would sit at a desk, so therefore <laughs> having it in front of me is easy, but maybe there's a way you can actually have it embedded into your pocket or uh, who knows, but it's, there's got to be a way to remember at least step one and step two. So what is the benefit of transporting to Lee Trauma Hospital versus the closest facility? And I, you know what, I think that that actually dovetails really well with the following question, uh, which is a bit more blunt, which says, why are we doing this? <laughs> Usually when there's a change to it because people have died. How many people have died? Well, let's get down to the brass tacks, eh? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not about a single case. That's the first thing. We're not doing this because of a single case that precipitated a change. Uh, once again, this is all about systems of care. And we've talked about, you know, having the entire system, HEMS, land, and, and a coordinated trauma system all together, and how that works. Well, if you just look at trauma systems, so trauma hospitals, this was a very interesting study out of Australia where basically they took the same hospital. They had the same surgeons, they had the same people, but all they did was implement a trauma service, meaning they had someone that oversaw the trauma, they had a TTL that worked with the ED, they had an inpatient service and a QA process. And they saw huge benefits. You know, not, um, you know, we're not talking changing the hospital, changing anything in the services they provide just by having someone oversee and have an inpatient service. Overall death rates went from 20 down to 12. The overall mortality went from 5.4% uh, down to 1.4%. And that is, you know, with ISS greater than 15, you know, that we're still, you're looking at the same benefits. You know, the more traumatized you are, the more, the bigger the benefit of having uh, that system there. And so, you know, we can see that in just a single system. And then if you look at larger scale studies, 
You know, this was a, a big study out of New England Journal of Medicine back in 2006, but basically they compared 18 level one trauma centers with 51 other hospitals that were non-trauma centers. Even some of them even had trauma teams. And if you look at the mortality, the 18 level one uh, hospitals had a morta in hospital mortality of 7.6 percent versus Okay, I think we are back up and running. Um, oh, are we back? Go right back at it. So do you hear us okay? Yes, we're good now. Go ahead. All right. right. Apparently lost audio. So uh, I apologize for that. A little bit of technical difficulty. But uh, let's get right back into it. So looking at that length of stay in eMERGE. So these, are res these patients are resource intensive. They require a lot of resource uh, resources in your eMERGE. Um, there's studies to show that they uh, delay care for non-trauma patients in your eMERGE. Their time to assess PIA in your eMERGE department goes up when these patients are there. Um, and with trauma teams, it doesn't. And the longer they stay in your department, the more unwell they're going to be. There's mortality just with the length of stay in eMERGE. And by having trauma teams, you get them out of your eMERGE, which is good for your eMERGE patients and good for your trauma patients. Idea. Well, okay, that being said, thanks Mike, um, so that's the benefit for the trauma system. Now we've had some questions that have come in um, online and I, I want to sort of run through a couple of them here now in this section. So um, burns and electrocutions are not covered in the field trauma triage guidelines or field trauma triage standard, but they're often associated with other significant physical injuries. Is it appropriate to request air ambulance attendance at the scene based on clinical judgment and potential associated injuries? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's exactly the, the issue. If you think that um, the patient journey is going to exceed the capacity of your local hospital, um, yet they do not meet the true step one, step two of the trauma triage guidelines, they'll probably meet the trauma center consultation guidelines of your actual local hospital. Therefore, it's reasonable if you hear air ambulances inbound or to activate the air ambulance. It's absolutely reasonable for those indications. Next question was, can you touch on crush to glove mangled pulses extremities step guideline in step two of the FTTS? It may be appropriate, is it appropriate to request an area ambulance for a crushed or amputated finger, toe, hand, or does it have to be proximal to the wrist and ankle? And this is where we get into local uh, over triage. Yeah. I mean, I recently had a case in one of the areas, which is actually a fairly urban center, where we requested because initially air was requested because the hand was caught in a press. So Seems reasonable. Reasonable. Could absolutely be a crushed um, extremity, or and it could also result in amputation proximal to wrist or ankle, so yeah. air was launched. Then when the medics, um, land medics pulled the hand out, they realized it was actually amputation of a distal tip of the finger. And you're in a relatively urban environment, which actually often has to be managed locally in the eMERGE or even plus or minus plastics consultation. Exactly. So in this situation, we were still inbound, and the land medics kept us coming, saying, well, we want the eMERGE physician to make a decision as to whether or not the air should be canceled or not. And that's not really necessary in the spirit. So although we talk about step three and step four, thinking about the patient journey, well, it's important to know that most fingertips can be managed locally in your eMERGE department, especially if you're in a large urban center. Yeah. Therefore, canceling air is reasonable in that situation. Um, if you know that it's like four or five fingers that are off one hand and you know that the local hospital is going to have to require that and you hear errors coming in, well, that's a different discussion. Um, Absolutely. But at this, at this point, um, I would cancel depending on my local patient journey. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. A couple of other questions we've had here is um, 
the operational guideline of the air ambulance standard, would a paramedic need to recognize that a response time or travel time to be greater than 30 minutes, or would CAC be able to make this determination on their own and send both an air and land ambulance? So, um, great question. So, um, is reasonable for a paramedic to be able to make that decision as to what my travel time is going to be based on road road conditions, conditions. of time? Um, CAT can be able to figure out necessarily what our inbound time for the aircraft will be, like or yeah. the Orange Communications can, can do that, and we relay that to, to CAC. But I think it's important to be able to understand your own local conditions, and I don't think necessarily as a paramedic on scene, that's something you need to concern yourself. The question you need to a ask yourself is, can I drive to Lee Trauma Hospital in less than 30 minutes, yes or no? Exactly. Um, and if this big orange machine lands in front of you, then we'll talk about that in the air and utilization standard. When we exactly. Get there. One question that came in, which is really interesting, is patients, to penet patients with penetrating trauma to head and neck may present with an airway management issue. Mm. So specific to airway management in note two, which is over here on the right side of the field trauma triage standard, which we saw earlier, um, of step one physiologic criteria, how does the direction, what is the direction for transport to closest ER transport coordinate with note three of transport step two, which says anatomic criteria to transport to lead trauma hospital. So I think what they're trying to ask is, Let's say in note two it says a paramedic is unable to manage the airway of a patient unlikely to survive transport to the trauma hospital, the patient must be transported to the closest ED. Mm -hmm. But if you're stabbed in the face, for instance, you are in the neck, you may actually have a airway issue, therefore you need to go to the local hospital. But it says in note three, in penetrating trauma, you should actually go, regardless of vital signs, to the, to the lead trauma hospital. hospital. So I think that, first of all, these are guidelines, these are standards. They're offline medical control, which means that in this situation you have a, it's impossible to write a standard that meets every unique thing. One of the common things we get is, is questions looking for the exception to the rule. And you'll mm -hmm. be able to find exceptions to the rule. I'm sure many of you are listening right now and going, what is my exception to the rule? You know what? These are rare situations. If you lose your airway from a stab wound to your neck, I think that if your judgment is the fact that you need to go to your local hospital because you have an airway compromise and you just don't think you can maintain it with BLS maneuvers, then fine, go to your local hospital. As yeah. per note two, no one is going to, in that incredibly exceptional circumstance, hold you to task because that was the wrong decision. But similarly, if you have someone that you think you can control the airway, as per step two, you're able to control the airway with BLS maneuvers and they are a penetrating trauma patient, then bring them to the V trauma hospital because recognizing you're stabbed in the face and neck and you're losing your airway, you still need surgical capability. Mm -hmm. And that surgical capability may not be available in your local ED. But all that surgical capability is going to be for naught if we can't control your airway and you lose it. So my answer, our answer to this would be, if you can maintain the airway as per step two, then yes, as per note three, bring them to the lead trauma hospital. If you can't maintain the airway at all in a penetrating trauma, I think that you're not wrong to go to the lead two. But at the same time, I think that you can make an argument still go to uh, the lead trauma hospital situation yeah. as well. So I'm going to have to hedge a little bit on that because it's, it's, um, it, it's a difficult, rare exception. Another question that came in is, you have a 17-year-old. Uh, which hospital would you go to in a city with a peds and adult lead trauma hospital? You know, in that situation, you look at your local destination policy. Exactly. It's all about what your local destination policy says. If your pediatric emergency department is uh, 18 and under, then... Right. And, and trauma sometimes in some centers, there's actually different. So adults are um, over age 16 yeah. and adults are uh, children are less than 16. But in other uh, registration in your PEDS department, sometimes it's 18. So I think it's about knowing your local system. And I think that's one of the things we really need to underscore here is that when this standard comes out, there's a lot of legwork that the, the paramedic chiefs and the ambulance services, the paramedic services need to do with their local networks to be able to figure out how this is going to affect my destination policy. Exactly. And, you know, base hospitals can help with that if requested as per their service agreements, but really destination policies are, are derived between the, the hospital, the Ministry of Health, as well as the paramedic services. Exactly. Um, Another question would be, for the operational guidelines of the air ambulance utilization standard, would a paramedic need to recognize the response time? Oh, I think we answered this one. I think we did. Okay. Um, and let's see. A few more coming in here. A few more coming in. Um, okay. Um, one question is, Sarnia, um, which is a local southwest question, has blood, CT, MRI, ER docs, and on-call surgeons. When do we choose London instead? Well, um, that is the work that we need to have done locally to be able to figure out when we implement this, where is the line where we transport to the lead trauma hospital versus your local hospital, which may or may not have surgical backup? So therefore, um, Sarnia, as an example, does have all those resources. 
If you're less than 30 minute drive to Lee Trauma Hospital, it very well could be that we need to change our destination policy to reflect this new standard. Exactly. Uh, because Sarnia, although it is well resourced, a good example would be Waterloo and Kitchener. Mm -hmm. uh, very well resourced hospitals with all kinds of backup, but still Hamilton is the Lee Trauma Hospital from that. Yeah. They're having those conversations with them. Um, a good example would be Toronto. North York General has all these resources, but Sunnybrook is the Lee Trauma Hospital. So they're having conversations amongst their local trauma system to say, what are our definitions going to be for each one of these different hospitals? So I know that there's meetings coming up to, talk, to address just this in terms of deployment plan for the Southwest, as they're doing in Hamilton and Ottawa and Toronto, mm -hmm. Thunder Bay and Sudbury, all across, in Kingston, all the way across Ontario. Exactly. Some of these questions we are going to... Um, um, we're going to touch on when we talk about the air ambulance utilization standard next. Um, so perhaps what I'll do is uh, pass this one to Mike because mm -hmm. I think it was really, um, uh, the question is over us. Was it 10 to 15 or 10 to 50? It, it, it is 10 to 50. When you look at the standards, they'll say between 10 and 50 is acceptable. Obviously, we, you know, that is a wide range and the goal is, is to be closer to 10 than 50. Um, and that is based on how when you look at your um, step threes and step fours, you know, how often are you going to implement them uh, up front? And if you're going to be using them all the time, your over triage is probably going to be closer to 50%, where if you're using them based on paramedic judgment, it's probably going to be closer to 10%. Mm, cool. I like it. Um, one other question we should answer as part of the FTDS before moving on to the, uh, the AAUS is elderly patients often have multiple comorbidities and frequently have Alzheimer's or dementia and will present with altered LOA. Does that change the FTT uh, standard, i.e., should we bring all elderly patients to Lee Trauma Hospital or does this risk uh, over triaging this population? Well, this is exactly what we were talking about in mm -hmm. step four. Um, we know that older patients have a higher morbidity um, and, and they, uh, their risk of injury and death increases over the age of 55, which is getting close to my age, so I'm a little bit concerned about that. Um, but the answer would be we're going to vastly over triage if we do. So these are the same sort of thing. The the 85 year old that falls over and looks like they may have some injuries but don't necessarily meet step one, step two, you go to local hospital. If for some reason air has been triaged or air is coming, um, at that point this is a discussion where we're going to have saying I don't know if field trauma triage guidelines are met but maybe the ultimate patient journey requires lead trauma hospital. So this is maybe where you're either going to be doing that transport secondarily yourself because the trauma center consultation guidelines are met because the doc needs a CT scan of the person's head because they're on Coumadin and they have a subdural. Um, or you're doing that transport yourself or you keep the air ambulance coming and they can do the transport too. Exactly. As an interfacility. Interfacility. Exactly. Now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the other um, questions that we receive when we move on to the air ambulance utilization standard. And one of the most commonly generated questions is what is meant by a modified scene response? So really, Let's think about it this way. You have a patient that's been involved in a trauma. They are a uh, meet step one, step two. It's a clear meet field trauma triage standard. So orange is launched. So they're inbound. You as a land paramedic have decided, I'm it's great, I hear ambulance is coming, your ambulance is coming, but I'm done my scene protocol and I'm going to my local hospital because my lead trauma hospital is greater than 30 minutes away. So, so you're on your way. Then you hear orange is coming. Orange, you arrive at ED, you go into your ED, um, the immersive physician starts working um, uh, along with you to try and resuscitate this patient and air lands, air comes in. Um, the orange paramedics recognize that this patient meets the field trauma standard, meets the guidelines, step one and step two, and they say, we want to take this patient to the lead trauma hospital. This would be a modified scene response. This means the patient has met FTTS and this is the key. The resuscitation that's been engaged upon by the immersed physician is all primary survey, so it's a, a key to be able to identify the primary resuscitation priorities, and B, only, they're only addressing the immediate threats to life. So they're not engaging upon multiple CTs, multiple x-rays, multiple other investigations. It's, it's I have done my primary survey, and I've done the, um, the immediate threats to life. I'm transporting this patient. Um, you can then transport this patient as a modified scene as orange, and then it's the responsibility of the transport medicine physician from orange, or the doc in the box, to then take that information and relay it to the um, um, trauma team leader at the receiving LTH. So essentially, we're looking at the initial assessment of management. It's basically just reversing the immediate life threat mm -hmm. and allowing them to transport the patient quickly and efficiently, once again modifying 
time. Great, exactly. Time to leave from the hospital. And recognizing too that the doc, the receiving doc, can decide, no, I'm actually comfortable keeping them based on my local resources here. I'm keeping this patient. A good example is um, like a place like Sarnia or a place like Barry. They they often say, you know what, this patient is injured, but I'm comfortable managing him. I have surgery, I have backup, I have all these things here. We can Orange will actually leave without the patient in those situations because they're well managed there. Yeah. But like a case that was involved in yesterday when I was on uh, as one of the Orange physicians, um, Orange landed in a, in a smaller hospital with a majorly injured injured patient with a chest crush. So clearly met step one, step two. Um, the physician intubated the patient, uh, put a chest tube in the patient, um, and all primary resuscitative, uh, primary surveys type stuff designed to address the immediate threat to life. We grabbed three uh, units of blood and we're out the door with this trauma patient because there was no surgical backup there. Mm -hmm. And I radio head to the lead trauma hospital and said, here's what we got. We're inbound in 10 minutes with X, Y, and Z. But actually, I actually did it earlier because as soon as we were in there, we knew this person's coming to the lead trauma hospital. And one can make an argument. Look, is this in a facility? You've been there for a while. You put a chest tube in. But that doc's busy in that hospital putting a chest tube in. So we pick up the phone as a doc in the box, talk to the TTL and say, just so you're aware, this is coming to you. They meet their field trauma triage guidelines. They're in the small hospital. We're going to be leaving in about 20 minutes. We're looking at a 40-minute flight. Get prepared. We'll be there in an hour. Exactly. So in theory, modified scene response, but um, definitely communication is the key to the receiving. The very big example we gave earlier was a good example of patients not meeting trauma guidelines, um, but still requires transport because they need to uh, go for the trauma center consultation guidelines. They need that CT scan. Exactly. Got it. Okay. So modified scene response. So given that that's a modified, one of the things that we probably should clarify is what's the difference between the rendezvous and a modified? And so do you want to love to field that one? This keeps coming up and this is so confusing and so really, I've really tried hard through this standard to try and get this message across. And I, I want to come at it from a couple of perspectives. Let's say you're the land paramedic and you are, you are on scene and you realize this person meets step one and step two but the lead trauma hospital is greater than 30 minutes, so you're going to a local hospital. You're going. Mm -hmm. So you have loaded and you're now moving down the road. Your next decision is you bring that person to that local ED unless something from Orange lands directly in front of you along your direct route and you can hand over to that patient. Okay? Exactly. So that is a rendezvous. So unless it's within the standard is specific about it, unless Orange is able to land within your direct route, um, direct path, um, you are not to rendezvous. Um, recognizing, and I want to clarify, there are areas in the province where as part of the discussions that come out of these standards have set up specific, unique geographic uh, exceptions to the rules. That's why you need to know your own local policy and it's trying to move this as a provincial talk. Um, we've got to make sure we still respect local decision making. Exactly. So that would be the rendezvous. So we want to make the decision making is should I go to Orange, should I do it? Make it very simple. I'm a land paramedic. This person meets field trauma triage guidelines. I can't go to the, F the lead trauma hospital because it's greater than 30 minutes. I'm going to my local hospital. Oh, look, here comes the orange helicopter and lands right in front of me. I'm now handing this patient over. Exactly. If they don't land in front of you, you go to your local ED. And then this lends well to our next question, which you got from online. It says, can you please review and clarify modified situations? Orange has landed on the helipad at a local hospital, but the patient has to go into the emergency department. And why is that? This was an enormously contentious discussion we've had with all our partners. And we have to look at it from, there are situations where you may pull up to the local ED and Orange is on the helipad of that small ED and you actually hand over care right at that currently, as what happens in some situations, you hand over care at the helipad, bypassing the ED and off you go. We looked at it from a, how do we adopt policy or standard that's supposed to exist for years to cover all situations versus unique situations. And what we figured out is that, let's say someone is really unstable and you are going to that um, local ED. Maybe that ED has an ED physician with blood or is able to intubate with an RSI or able to put a chest tube in that patient. But now we're actually driving right literally past the doors of that ED to hand over to the orange aircraft when really that person needs to be intubated immediately and needs to have a chest tube placed before their 40 minute flight to the lead trauma hospital. Let's go in that ED. Exactly. Because what happens if it's pouring rain out? What happens if it's 3 o'clock in the morning and it's pitch black and all of a sudden you're putting a very unstable patient in the back of a helicopter with two critical care paramedics that are going to try and do that in the back of that helicopter? That is not the place for that. Mm -hmm. Let's let the transfer of care happen in the ED so where we actually have the ED physician in concert with the orange paramedics, in concert with the land paramedics saying, okay, look, we're all here together. It's good lighting. It's not raining. Let's do these critical life saving procedures. 
Let's call it a modified and let's move. Exactly. It's not minus 40. Yes. So let's do this. So that's what we have. We have scene yes. and we have modified scene. And modified scene happens in the ED. Exactly. So there may be situations where you could absolutely, you're, I agree, you could actually go right past that ED and put them in that helipad, put them in the helicopter and fly to Lee Trauma Hospital and you're delaying time by going in that emergency department only to then go back out to the helicopter. For every one or two of those, I bet you I can give you four or five examples where you actually go directly to the helicopter and then go right back into the ED because the person is so unstable. Mm -hmm. Or worse, let's say the patient goes directly to the helicopter, bypasses the ED, they launch, and something horrible happens to that patient en route, whereas that ED physician says, had I known, had I been given the opportunity to resuscitate that patient, I could have grabbed two units of Oneg, I could have put a chest tube in that person, I could have intubated them and safely transported them, versus them having a terrible, catastrophic outcome in the helicopter, and they drove right past my doors. And that is a coroner's inquest waiting to happen. Yeah, and that's a diff. That's a exactly. It's a coroner's inquest waiting to happen. So let's not have that day. one. <laughs> we don't don't want that case. So to simplify it, let's sum up. There is scene, and scene would be you landed on my scene, or I'm transporting and you did a rendezvous because they landed right in front of me. So that's still scene. Yep. Or there's modified scene, and modified scene means it's in the ED. Exactly. Okay. Good. I'm glad we had the discussion because that's so key. So if I'm transporting a patient meeting the FTTS to my closest ED, am I able to rendezvous with the air ambulance if I hear they're responding? Well, I think we've answered that. If that helicopter or whatever resource Orange is sending to help out in this scenario lands in front of you, then yes, you can rendezvous. But otherwise, you are continuing on to that local eMERGE where the patient becomes a modified patient in the local eMERGE and we can move them from there. 100% agree. So while the step um, is actually put under B on the ambulance utilization standard, requesting an on-scene response, question through our point three says, while en route to the local hospital, paramedics may rendezvous with the air ambulance if, one, the air ambulance is able to land along the direct route of the land ambulance, and two, it will result in significant reduction in transport time to the most appropriate hospital, the terminal hospital. Exactly. So key. Um, recognizing too, there are unique geographic areas in the province where there is exceptions to the rule. So we have to we have to bow to those. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that if this this talk moves provincially, uh, we need to have that disclaimer. Exactly. My patient meets step one, step two of the FTTS, and the Lee Trauma Hospital is greater than thirty minute drive from my location. Should I request the air ambulance, even though I can be at the closest ED faster than an air ambulance can get to my location? I think this comes back to the whole idea of system of care, right? So we're going, uh, then we definitely should, right? This is a patient that meets step one, step two, needs to go to a lead trauma hospital. You are not the clo they're not your closest facility, so you're going to go to your local ED. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the ultimate patient destination for that patient uh, or is likely going to be that lead trauma hospital. So having the air ambulance launch and resulting in either a modified scene, depending on how long they're in the facility, mm -hmm. or an inter-facility request based on that uh, uh, patient condition results in more efficient transfer to that lead trauma hospital. That's a great point. I just want to touch on one thing you said there, Mike. You mentioned depending on how long they're in that sending facility in terms of modified. I actually brought that back to the leadership at Orange to clarify that. And they actually mentioned, although historically we've talked about 20 and 30 minutes, and I've seen those numbers banded about, it really boils down to you can be in, a, in the sending facility for even longer depending so long as the resuscitation still remains right. within the immediate threats to life or primary resuscitation. Right. I'm going to say I was guilty because I thought for some reason there's a magic 30 minutes and I actually found out where that was. It's actually in the transport positions orientation manual at Orange which talks about 30 minutes and it's an ideal 30 minutes. But nevertheless, um, now it's more just if you're still on primary survey Sorry. and adjusting immediate threats to life, but you're still in modified, modified. mode. That being said, uh, I think this it behooves the, the, did I just say behooves? You did say oh, behooves. It's awful. Well it's, awful. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's the responsibility of the transport position to contact their tree, the, the trauma team leader to make sure that they are fully aware as soon as possible. Exactly. Because sometimes it's complicated. Maybe you're going from a hospital that actually has surgical capability. And maybe if the person is so profoundly unstable, you don't want to fly out of that, that small hospital with surgical back. Maybe you want to do a laparotomy first. And that's where that discussion with the uh, TTL who's accepting the patient and the sending doc uh, is best to happen. Interesting we had that exact case not that long ago. Yeah. And, um, and so it, this is all about trying to figure out what the best resources we have.
Speaking so, of resources. Exactly. So are we to use the helicopter for medical calls when we have a significant transport time to the most appropriate hospital? So for example, stroke patient that is over an hour's drive to a stroke center by land or a pediatric VSA uh, that is you know, an hour from the closest PEDS ED, but 35 minutes from the closest county ED. So definitely for stroke, I yeah. mean, it's actually listed right in the actual medical indications. So if we can, and it's not just the three hour window or three and a half hour window, because really truthfully, it's the earlier you're getting to the stroke center, the earlier they get their medication to revert to the lytic, the better their outcome is. Absolutely. So if it's faster to go by air for a stroke patient, that is a medical indication for air ambulance utilization, so yes. Exactly. But I want to talk a little bit about VSAs. We get, we seem to be getting um, uh, contacts and activations for air for medical VSAs. And the air ambulance utilization standard actually talks about under the medical indications and the clinical conditions is resuscitation from respiratory or cardiac arrest. So you've got a ROSC and now they're back. This is a great indication to bring them to the to the the hospital, the larger hospital that has the resources, the higher level ROSC care. Um, but current arrest isn't necessarily the, the best indication. Exactly. That being said, I know right now some of my colleagues are, are going to be standing up in their areas saying, yes, but our local protocols still say launch for these indications. I get that. There are areas in the province, I know that Anthony Sharp, if he's listening right now, would yeah. tell me that absolutely there are areas within the province where we do launch for medical VSAs. So that's, that's been approved by the ministry as part of their deployment plan. Exactly. Based on unique geography. And so is the helicopter allowed to meet us en route to transfer these patients to the most appropriate ED? We talked about that. Yeah. That is an ED, but it should be, as per point, um, as per listed in the area civilization standard, it should be, as per point three, if it would result in a significant reduction in transport time to the most appropriate ED. Exactly. So if an air ambulance on-scene response is canceled because the patient does not meet guidelines, can the paramedics request continued air response to the hospital due to special circumstances? So rural, remote, hospitals without CT scanners? I think we've answered this. I think we've talked about uh, this question in various permutations and very, uh, is sure, of course you can, right? It's all about what is the patient's ultimate journey? Where are they going to end up needing to go? That's right. So if you have a patient, like the Barry's Bay example is a great example here. So exactly. you have a patient that's fallen off a cliff, they don't meet step one and step two, but you're pretty convinced they're you having seen this countless times before that you know that you're the one that automatically has to bring them in, but then you use the land medics have to then drag them back out again to Ottawa to get them to the, the lead trauma hospital for the investigations they need as per the CCSO's trauma center consultation guidelines. Well, sure, then keep them coming. But recognizing this is more directed to the orange paramedics, recognizing that sometimes when you arrive seen, you're going to recognize that some patients, uh, some paramedics have kept you coming for their patient, even though step one and step two are not met, because they feel that their local resources are going to be overwhelmed by this, and they'll still require a secondary transport as per an interfacility consultation. Well, that's a great um, indication for us, and we need to be recognizing that, that judgment call by the paramedics. Exactly. And supporting it. And supporting it. Yeah. And, because so all it's going to take is one paramedic that jumps out of an aircraft and say, why did you call me? Why am I going to be here? And then you're never going to get called again. Exactly. And that's a key sort of thing to understand. So what is the process when a land ambulance calls for an air ambulance? How long does it take for an air ambulance to prepare for takeoff? How long does it typically take air to respond? Well, that's a good question. There's a lot of variables associated with that. Sure. I mean, from the call to the OCC mm -hmm. and then the medical call taker taking information, then that has to go to the aviation side of the house, uh, which then has to provide information to the pilots as to where they're going mm -hmm. um, and where they're going to respond to and from. Um, pilots then have to do a weather check. And there's a lot of uh, variables that, to, that take a weather check that could be two minutes because it's severe clear, as they say, and there's no weather in the entire area, so they know if the call comes in they're going to be able to go, versus you know, there's storms popping up all over the place, so they have to really spend a lot of time figuring out, are they going to be able to go and come back? Um, or they're going to use instrument flight rules and have to figure out alternates and all these different other aviation pieces that we don't, that we don't understand. Exactly. There's a <laughs> lot of things that go into that that we don't understand, and they have to figure it out. So it, that is a variable time. From acceptance, it usually takes... Give or take, what, about 10 minutes, I would say? Yeah, to... so usually it's about 10 minutes for the weather check, and during that time they can be ready in the aircraft, and most most are in the air, uh, but there's variabilities like air traffic control, other impending things, but usually we're up in the air uh, 10 minutes after that, yeah. um, actually en route to facility. 
Um, but I think that one of the, I think if we, the origin of this question came from our land paramedics, I think we need to be able to understand and saying, look, this is roughly how the system works, but don't worry about that. Yeah. Activate the air ambulance, but great, but then follow your scene protocols. And if they're not on long final and visually see them descending as you're ready to go, you go. You're going. And if they land in front of you, rendezvous. If they don't, hand over care as modified scene in the ED. Exactly. In the ED being the key piece for there. So if I arrive at my closest ED with a patient who meets FTS and I see the air ambulance on the helipad, should I go into the ED with my patient or should I go to the helipad to transfer care to the ambulance crew? I think we've answered that one. Answered that one. I think that's key is that this is a key fundamental change and it's based on just that issue we, we hammered home. We want it to happen in good lighting in the controlled environment of the actual ED. With the ED physician saying, here's everything I can pro potentially provide this patient in terms of resources at my hospital. With the air crew saying, this is everything I can provide them here. And the land crew saying, this is what we've done so far and what we can provide them. And therefore, every resource can be brought to bear for that patient in that location before moving them out. Exactly. It's just the, using every resource we have for these critically injured patients. So what I'm, I'm attending to a trauma patient on scene and the air ambulance arrives at the scene but it determines that the patient does not meet FTTS, great. I mean, that's exactly what we were talking about earlier about Barry's Bay. Exactly. So, so I keep sorry, it shouldn't be like that. that I'm sure that ha there's a thousand places just like that all across Ontario every day. Exactly. And it, it really just comes back to the patient journey. Yeah. Right? And then working in consultation as a team. The land uh, medics, the flight medics from Orange or the flight, the crew from Orange, the transport physician doc in the box discussing what is the best way to go about taking care of this patient. And this is why the doc in the box is so valuable. I mean, um, the Toronto machine has landed a bunch of places where they pick up the phone and they go, we've been requested by air, by land, we've landed, this person does not meet FTTS, but the land, the air medics go, look, I, I know this hospital, I've been yeah. here before, this guy's going to need to go to St. Mike's or, or Sunnybrook, I just, I just can't, I, I don't think we should leave scene. Absolutely. Well, then we stay with the patient. They go into the local hospital. We call ahead of that local hospital as a doc in the box and say, hey, look, this is what's coming. Sounds like he's got this. You're probably going to need a CT scan or X, Y, and Z. We're happy to move him. We just can't move him the way he is right now automatically. So assess him. We'll stay on scene. Um, if, if you think you can keep him, great, we'll leave. But if you think he needs to go, pick up the phone, call, critical, get the TTL to accept, and we'll move him to an inter-facility. And from the air guys, you need to know that if any time while we're doing this, if a more acute call comes in, we know where you are. We can receive you. We can re, we can redispatch you. Exactly. We can move you if we need to. And we can reprioritize or retriage. So, can the air ambulance paramedic crew perform a modified scene response with any other medical or obstetrical conditions? I'm so glad we asked this question. I'm so yeah. glad because the reality is that a lot of the medical conditions, there is no predetermined automatic accept. Exactly. So. So the reality is, um, in some situations, you're only going to be um, re responding to scene under the air ambulance utilization standard um, if, it can re if it can reduce their time to the closest hospital, the closest, most appropriate hospital. Most. So if that's, if that's stroke, then, it, then it's the stroke center, the lo local stroke center. But if it's, um, it doesn't make sense to launch us for one of these medical conditions if the land vehicle is going to get into the appropriate hospital quicker. There's no automatic except for OB or medical conditions at this point. Exactly. But this is where it's going to change in the future. We're going to have, as we're developing STEMI systems and more comprehensive and elaborate stroke systems, as we're developing some of these other new initiatives, there may we may start seeing some of these new sort of programs evolve where we do bring you to the, the, the direct STEMI center. And, and that is where our local networks are so important. And yet again, that's why we need to pay attention to what our local policies are. Exactly. Okay. So, I've heard of cases where the receiving air ambulance crew is a dual PCP. If the patient requires intubation, needle insertion, and the crew cannot hand over the patient safely with these pieces of equipment in place, what is the process? So, so that does happen, and there are times the aircraft is staff PCP, uh, primary care paramedic. In that situation, you, need to, you cannot um, hand over um, from land as an advanced care paramedic having done advanced life support patient care procedures that exceed the scope of the primary care paramedic. So in this situation, the primary care paramedic should be able to take over, come in the land vehicle with you to the local hospital. Yeah. And then we have to be able to make decisions about how we're going to transport this patient. Do we need to use sending staff? So can they send an RN or an RT from the sending facility to bring this patient over? So there's other kind of logistics pieces there. So this is hopefully a rare phenomenon. I know that Orange is working very hard to increase their level of care in a standard fashion. Uh, but there will be exceptions to the rule, but um, 
recognize that as an advanced care paramedic, you cannot hand over to a primary care paramedic something that exceeds their scope of practice. So this is another question, and I think we've somewhat answered it, but maybe we just want to clarify to make sure we've covered all the bases. If a crew arrives at the ED, the air ambulance has already landed. Is this considered a modified, or does the ED accept care of the patient and it become an interfacility? So I think it is still a modified if it falls within the criteria that we've already discussed. They have initiated just that initial life-saving primary assessment and primary sort of life-saving interventions, yeah. right? If it's beyond that, if their care has gone outside of that and they've been there um, and they've done numerous other interventions, then it probably is an interfacility. But ultimately, this is where there's a lot of discussion between the sending, the receiving, the doc in the box, you know, trying to make sure that we are doing what's best for the patient in the patient journey. Right, so sometimes it takes a while to get the aircraft there. So let's say you go to like an area that has a CT scanner. It's not fair necessarily for the trauma team leader at, at the Lee Trauma Hospital to say, um, all of a sudden this guy flies into me and I'm the inbound trauma team leader as a modified um, response. I can't help but notice this guy's had CT scans, his fractures have been set, and I have X, Y, and Z done. Well, that clearly should have been an interfacility, and they should have been engaged upon the acceptance and discussion of that transport well ahead of that. So um, if, the, if the care exceeds the primary resuscitation phase and the primary immediate threats to life, then at that point it becomes an interfacility, and that's why critical is involved, and, and then we have these interfacility transports. Can a paramedic request air ambulance outside of the standard based on judgment? For example, a patient who's having signs and symptoms consistent with a dissecting aortic aneurysm. The crew can get to the closest ED in less than 30 minutes, but assume that the hospital cannot provide definitive care due to limited resources, i.e., the patient journey. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think that comes back to the known clinical conditions that we already have there. If you look at the medical clinical conditions, shock, especially hypotensive with altermentation is there. And it's not a, they're not giving you it has to be this form of shock or that form of cause of shock. It is shock, mm -hmm. right? So if you think that the ultimate journey of this patient is going to exceed the care for the patient in that facility, then yeah. And if you think that they, we're going to shorten their time to definitive care, absolutely. absolutely. Care. Yeah, absolutely. So they can. Um, but if the crew can get to the closest ED in less than 30 minutes, but assume the hospital cannot provide those the definitive care to the limited resources, then absolutely it, it's a reasonable indication. And then also fits with the other considerations in step three, which says if in the judgment of a paramedic or ambulance communication officer, but in this situation the paramedic, mm -hmm. the perceived severity of the reported injuries, um, or the patient, not, the patient cannot be reasonably reached by land ambulance, then an air ambulance may be requested. So it's either a geographic thing or their injuries are so severe, they need to go, they need to go. They need to go. Great. Well, oh. that was long. I think that's the longest webinar that we have ever done. Yes, that is almost two hours. So uh, for those, let me see, those that have stayed online with us the whole journey, I appreciate that. Well, we appreciate that. And um, we hope that we've been able to review these standards and be able to bring some um, light to some of your questions. Uh, we want to sort of sum up by saying this educational initiative is over and above the educational initiatives that's going to come out through the, uh, the Ministry of Health, as you see with your training bulletin, as well as any initiatives that your service, your paramedic services are going to provide you as the OAPC and the uh, paramedic services are responsible for the delivery of the basic life support patient care standards. Uh, as always, the base hospital is happy to serve as a resource if you have questions. So we'd be happy to field those as required. Um, but um, this is uh, what we wanted to bring to you today. So thank you for your attention. Steph, do you want to bring us out? Sure. I was just having a look to see if there were any other questions online, but it doesn't look like it. Uh, so yeah, once again, thank you to both of you for a great presentation. The feedback in the background has been extremely positive. So once again, thank you guys. Uh, to anyone who wants a copy of the recording, it will be available on our website. Uh, lhsc.on.ca slash bhp or feel free to contact me and I can put you in touch with the link. Uh, once again, thanks a lot guys. Have a great day.